Um, anybody remember way back long time ago, late 2021? <laughs> a long time ago. Seems like forever ago, right? Still COVID and all these things happening. But a new puzzle craze hit the scene. Now, who are my puzzle people in the room? Puzzle people? Okay, I see those hands. Me too. I love puzzles. Uh, I, I, lo I do a puzzle page every day. One at least, two or three most times. I love puzzles. I think I do them because I've convinced myself it's going to stop the aging process and keep me mentally sharp. I don't know, but I hope. But back in 2021, there was this new puzzle craze. And, you know, it really didn't take off until you could post your score online. That's when it really kind of, you know, shot through because you could easily click a button and on social media, you could show others how smart you were and how quickly you got the answer. And so anybody remember this? So your social media feed became just overwhelmed with little yellow and green squares. Anybody else remember that? Yep, yep, of course I'm talking about Wordle. Wordle. All right, who are my Wordle people out there? Daily Wordle people? How many of you have already done today's Wordle? Anybody? Look at there, we got one. And that's why I did not pick the New York Times one today. So. I do love puzzles, I love it, and, but you know, I never fell into the Wordle craze, primarily because, th this may shock you, as a guy who makes his living public speaking, words are not my thing. I hate Scrabble, I'm terrible at it, um, and Wordle to me falls in the words with friends Scrabble category, and so I've kind of always avoided that. But it seems that, you know, at the time, everybody was doing it, uh, talking about it, posting about it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's very simple. You, it's, a, it's a word game, okay? It's a five-letter word, and you have six attempts to guess the five-letter word. And as you do, you get little hints as to how close you're getting to the word. And I thought, well, what about if we just did a wordle together this morning? Now, this will be kind of fun. All right, let's see if it's going to work. Can we see the squares on the screen? They're very faint, but as I type the words, they'll be in there. So we have, all right, who are we going to trust? This, and this is not the New York Times. So, <laughs> Jesus, I don't think you can put proper names in there. <laughs> audio. Okay, so I heard audio, so we're going to type that in. Are you seeing that? Okay, so let's hit enter. Oh, we've got an A. We've got an A. All right, somebody else give me another word. What was it? Prank. Prank. P-R. Oh, sorry. I can't type A-N-K. Oh, we got the P and the A in the right spot. Look at Garrett go. Drawing. Hold on. I heard plate. Plate. P-L-A-T-E. Enter. Oh! Rachel, finish it out for us. So we know it's P-L-A. Place. C-E. Boom. Look at that. You guys are so smart. Don't look at the statistics there because that'll just, uh, <laughs> in fact, get to the next slide. Hurry. <laughs> well, wasn't that fun? <laughs> you know, what's interesting is this game really isn't new. Uh, in fact, the mechanics are nearly identical to a, a, a pen and paper game that came out in like 1955 called Giotto. And then there was a TV show you may have seen called Lingo that, you know, so there's all variations of this. But here's the, here's the background of Wordle. So it was actually created by a software engineer, a Welsh software engineer named Josh Wardle. He's all over there on the right side of the screen for you. And uh, he created it actually in 2013. Think about that. Um, he kind of had it. They did it for a while just among he and his partner there. And, and, they, and then it kind of just died off. And then what happened, uh, well, let me tell you this too. The first game he had had all 13,000 five-letter words as possibilities. But they found that to be a little too challenging so that they trimmed the list down to 2,000 words, creating five years' worth of puzzles, if you can imagine that. COVID hits, though, and his partner, uh, Palak Shah, really got into puzzles, and he brought it back, and he rolled it out online. And then as he rolled it out online, he started telling friends and family about it, and it just spread like wildfire. And so in November 1st of 2021, there were basically 90 people that played it, November 1st. And by the second week of January, 2022, so what are we talking about? Eight weeks there, over 2 million people were playing it. Yes. Can you imagine that? Could you just think about it? And then 
January 31st of 2022, the New York Times bought it from Wardle from a, for an undisclosed price in the low seven figures. Not a bad little hobby, huh? <laughs> I need that kind of hobby. And the fad continues. In fact, the New York Times bought it and they continue to develop it. They actually hired an editor for Wordle, if you can believe that, that curates the words that you see every day on the official Wordle site. And then you have variations. Who are my variation people out there? Okay. What do you play, Garrett? As many as I can. Okay. So do you do like Quartle and do you do Octurtle? Octurtle is where you have eight squares and you try to figure out eight words at one time. You do a math one or you showed me a math. What was that one? Nerdle. Nerdle. Or there's, uh, there's another one called, what did I write down here? Uh, mathle. Ma don't make fun of him for Nerdle. Leave him alone. He did really well when he showed it to me. There's also Mathle. Isn't that crazy? You see all these things. Who knew something as simple as trying to guess a, a correct word would become such a big phenomenon. As I said, so big, the New York Times bought it, they kept it free, they've hired an editor. It's crazy. And you're probably thinking, this has been fun, Brent, but what does this have to do with anything? Well, we're in this series where we're talking about in plain sight, where we're looking to see God all around us, theology all around us, in the everyday. And I thought it'd be fun to start with this one, because here we see in Wordle, the power of words, the importance of words, the importance of even picking the right words for Wordle and in our daily lives, the right words that we speak or we type and how, what those words that we pick, the ones that we use, the ones that we say, what does that reflect on us? How does, what does that say about us? And what does that say about our faith? Because I think we would all know this. We all would agree with this statement that words matter and words have power. Do you agree with that? Words have power and they matter. It's not earth shattering, but I think we often forget that truth. And if it's not entirely our fault, because if we take ourselves back to the elementary school playground, what was the one rhyme that we used to say about words that would tell us the opposite of this? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is garbage. I mean, can somebody tell me why we think that is a good thing to teach kids? The other thing that's on my soapbox, the item sometimes, is we also teach girls, if a boy hits you, that just means he likes you. That's terrible, <laughs> setting them up for accepting physical abuse. Stop it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Anybody found that to be true in your life? No. I was looking on a website, and it was, a, it was a behavioral health services website, and they said this. They said, this rhyme is intended to be used as a defense against name-calling and verbal bullying, meant to increase resiliency, avoid physical retaliation, and to help victims remain calm. Now, praise God, they went on to say, and this is terrible. This is not good. This is not something we endorse. It's, in fact, this is, couldn't be further from the truth. But as a culture... We seem to have leaned into the falsehood of this rhyme, haven't we? I mean, today it seems like anything goes when it comes to speech. You can say anything you want, and there's no consequences. Uh, in fact, if you look at how we speak, at how we type, and how we post on all these things, we find our speech is very polarizing. It's biting, it's dividing, it's rude, it's condescending, it's hateful. And often, the more those things it is, the more the algorithms love it and push it up to the top and we retweet and repost and like and share and all these things. And we find this vicious circle just happening to us all because of the powerful words that we're using. And we find little accountability for what we say and do. Don't believe me about words? Go look at Twitter. In fact, don't. It'll depress you. I mean, it's like that is a cesspool of just say whatever you want with no consequences. And whether it's the spoken word or the written word, I think we would all agree. We wish in our culture that we could see a little bit more of the words appropriately or aptly spoken and a little less anything goes. And I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that it's not like we are without instruction it's not like the Bible is silent when it comes to our speech or how we talk and interact with one another. In fact, the Bible has a lot to say about it. I just went to the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, you know, where Solomon is passing down the wisdom that he has learned. And just look at some of the things he says. 
Proverbs 12, 18, he says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. In that, man, amen to that. Or Proverbs, uh, what is it? Proverbs 15, 25, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. How many of you can look at that and go, I have been the recipient in my anxiety to hear a kind word that has brought me healing. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Well, there's the theme verse for Twitter right there, except just the harsh stuff. Proverbs 15, 23, a person finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word. Or Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Ooh, don't you like that? Don't you like that image? I mean, think about gracious words are a honeycomb. I love honey. It's so sweet. I love it. Just put it on bread. Put it on anything. I don't care. Man, it's just, and the words that can be sweet to our souls. Or even Ecclesiastes 5, 3. A dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that's just a little bit of what the Bible says. I mean, I just went right there to Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and that was it. But I think that helps us understand what we say matters and the power to our words. And, 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 and we should be paying attention to these things. I mean, if we, in the New Testament, there's a short and very practical letter written by James, most likely the brother of Jesus. He was a leader in the church in Jerusalem. And he writes a letter talking about speech and the words that we use. He's writing it to those who are outside of Israel who are following Jesus. But listen to what he speaks, what he tells these early Christ followers about how they use their words. We find it in James chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He writes this, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach are judged more strictly... We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Anybody smell the Canadian uh, wildfires coming into our neck of the woods this past week? The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the body, parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. James continues, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now, it may seem a bit disconnected here, but the reason I started where I did is because it's important. Because really, this whole passage we read is all about the things we speak, starting with me and Amy and Steve, and the others that stand up here on stage, those of us who are teachers. But he's making a point for us to all to understand just how powerful the tongue can be. And it's really a word of warning for me to, be, to not take what I do lightly. Because as much as I may not like it, me standing up on here on Sunday speaking to you carries weight. What I say right now has impact. You are listening well, some of you are, most of you are, just kidding. And you're thinking about what I'm saying. I hope you're thinking about it. And I'm either reinforcing things you already believe and giving you confidence in it, or I'm challenging long-held beliefs that may be pushing you in a different direction. And either, either way, what I'm saying to you is going to have the potential to influence you. Well, I hope it does anyway. I hope we're not just here throwing words into the air. And with that, with what I do, with us speaking on Sunday like this, it comes with great responsibility. And I hope you understand and know 
But none of us take this responsibility lightly. We carry a heavy burden knowing that when we stand up here, we spend hours studying, thinking through, processing it as a group to make sure that the things that come out of our mouths line up with what the things we believe God wants us to be saying. But then after James really lays it on us teachers there, then he moves from talking about us to all of us because it's a good reminder for all of us just how important what we let fly out of our mouths really is. And he gives us some interesting metaphors. These are things that his community, that those around him would have absolutely understood and it would have resonated with them. But did you notice what he talks about? He talks about how the words that we say, the power of our words, they have impact on not just others, but on us. They, they, they impact our spiritual condition. And not only that, the words that we speak, the words that we type, the things that we communicate even set the direction of our lives. I mean, look at those metaphors that he used. He starts by talking about the horses and bridles. Any horse people out there? I've ridden occasionally, but how important is a bridle when you're on a horse? Optional? Usually not, right? Bridle's kind of a significant piece of equipment with a horse, especially if you want to direct where the horse is going. If you don't care, just jump on. It's fine. But if you really want to go a certain direction, that bridle is critical. And notice what James says about that bridle. He's not necessarily talking about power overpowering the animal. He's really talking about direction, steering the animal. And then James reinforces that by talking about ships, large ships. Anybody been on a large ship? I love cruises. We've been on a few in our life. And man, those ships are massive. And what steers a ship? Usually a very small device under the water that you can't see that directs that ship where the captain the, that wants it to go. And again, he's not talking about the power of the rudder. He's talking about how it changes directions. And the words that we speak are so critical to setting the direction of our lives. Not only then that he talks about the tongue, he talks about how it can even set a fire. And the destruction that can come from one misused, misspoken word. And you don't have to answer this, but how many of us have been on the receiving end of that? How many of us have been on the delivering end of that? That's even a worse question. But as I said, one misused word, one unwise remark said aloud or circulated on the Internet can lead people to riot usually resulting in the, lo result of the loss of property and life. I mean, we have seen, haven't we, in our culture in the last three, five, eight years, the power and the devastation of what a tongue can do when not used properly, when not used with wisdom, when not used with humility and discernment and restraint. How desperate are we in our world for words aptly spoken, gracious words, wise words, words that are sweet to the soul. What I love about James is if you read his entire letter, he never pulls any punches. He doesn't hide anything. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He just kind of puts it right out there. He's not painting a rosy picture. I mean, look at what he said. He look, he's writing this to people that he loves, and he says, you know, look around. Look at the animal kingdom. Every animal around us can be tamed by humanity, and haven't we done that? Just go to the zoo, and you can see it. But look at the tongue. The tongue within your mouth cannot be tamed. The tongue will bless and curse, and sometimes even in the same sentence. What comes out of our mouths is a barometer for our spiritual condition. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. How about you? I don't want it to be that way. But it's true, isn't it? When we stop and we evaluate and we go back and look at the things we posted on Twitter or Facebook or Insta or whatever, and we begin to evaluate and we think, hmm, or the emails we send or the, even the conversations that we've had, and we begin to evaluate them. Do they look more like a fire or do they look more like the honeycomb? Let's move on. That's difficult. That's, I don't like that. Yeah, exactly. Carry on. 
All this that James has written leads us to the same point. What you say will lead to what you do, and it all depends on and reveals who we really are. And if we stopped there, if we stopped with what James wrote, we would feel pretty hopeless, I think, because he, he does say, who can control it? Your tongue is awful. It's horrible. It's full of evil. And he says, who can control it? No one. Well, praise God, Jesus has something to say about this because it's not all hopeless. Because what James is doing is he's really reinforcing and echoing words of Jesus. Because Jesus has this encounter with the Pharisees and Jesus is doing miracles and the Pharisees, they're wanting to really criticize him. And they even to at one point, they look at Jesus and they say, you know why you can cast out a demon? Because you are working with Beelzebub. You are working with Satan. That's why you're able to do this. And Jesus, like he always does, he uses this as an opportunity to instruct and teach and really to turn this back on themselves. And in Matthew chapter 12, we see this story. And look at what Jesus says to the Pharisees, these religious leaders. He said, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers. Woo, Jesus is salty right here. Wow. How can you who are evil say anything good? Okay, see where James is picking up his words from? Jesus continues, he says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Oh, I don't like that. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they've spoken for by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Wow. That's tough. We don't like those words, do we? Because they're very, very challenging. And here's what we want to do. <laughs> here's what our, our Christianity likes to do. Well, then the best thing for us to do is we need to make some more rules. Because that's what Jesus is saying. So we want to create a list of words that are appropriate and a list of words, Amy, that are inappropriate. Sorry. <laughs> Called her out. No. Now, isn't that what we want to do? And then we create the list and we think, well, as long as I don't say these words, then I'm okay. And if that's where your mind goes, you have completely missed what Jesus is saying here. Because Jesus is not saying, let me give you a list of 10 appropriate words and 10 inappropriate words. What Jesus is saying is get to the root of the problem. Look at your heart. Because if your heart is after Jesus, if you are in Christ, then what will flow out of you because of the transforming work of Jesus Christ will be good, will be appropriate. It won't be perfect. My life is an example of that. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times where I say things and I get caught up in myself and then I'm like, oh, crap. I can't believe I just said that. Me and Jesus have to go have a little conversation and I feel the, the conviction of it. And you know what I find? Is I find a loving savior who says, I got you, Brent. I got you. You're doing all right, keep going. Confess, repent, and move forward. And recognize that the transforming work of Christ in me is a work in progress, it's ongoing. It's not one and done, it will continue to be worked out in my life. Maybe you find it that way in yours. But also, when I think about what Jesus is saying, I think there's a challenge for us beyond just our own personal transformation. I think there's also a challenge to us in what we are lending our voices to, where we are putting our voices. Because I struggle with this and how easily we find it to excuse those around us that use their words to do nothing but tear other people down. And we excuse it and they set these destructive fires and we justify it, we ignore it, we, you know, God forgive us, we'll even praise it or spiritualize it as if it doesn't matter. And it does. It does. Business leaders, politicians, even pastors who reveal to us what's on the inside 
by the words they use. And there's a challenge for us. I'm not saying we look for perfection, but good grief. If they hold up the name of Jesus and they don't look like Jesus, it's time for us to walk away. It's time for us to move on. We're following an antichrist if we don't. And we're giving our voice to those things. I mean, how many celebrity pastors have to fall before we understand the danger of this? It's a real problem. And I'm not calling for us to revolt. I'm just saying maybe it's time for us to stop excusing it, justifying it to others, or blindly following when they've shown us who they really are. The fruit is evident. What does our fruit say about us? That's where we need to be paying attention. And as difficult as it is for us to hear, Jesus does say there will be a day that we give an account for the things that we've spoken. That frightens me a little bit, but only to the point where I forget exactly what Jesus is talking about. Because when I stand before God one day, I won't be standing alone. Those who are in Christ will not be standing alone. When I have to give an account, you know what God will see? Jesus standing there with me and saying, yeah, I covered all that. I covered all that. You remember that word you said, Brent, that really hurt that person's feelings? Yeah, I covered that too. Everything in the past, everything in the present, everything in the future. But there is power here in what Jesus is saying. A moment for us to take a step back because the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What does what is coming out of your mouth say about what's inside you? Again, don't care for that question. But I think as people who are followers of Jesus, those are the type of questions we need to be asking. Those are the type of things. Anybody else just look around sometimes and think, man, what the world desperately needs is those gracious words, those words that are sweet to the soul. I do. I think there are so many people hurting and so many people looking and searching and seeking. And the last thing they need, yeah, they may have screwed up their lives. They may be walking in a bad direction. And the last thing they need is somebody to come along and say, you terrible loser. What they need is somebody that says, I love you. I care for you. Can we walk this path together? I mean, as we said before, we know our words have power. Our words have power to build up or to destroy. James says it. Jesus talks about it in Proverbs, puts it this way in Proverbs 18, 21. It says the power, the tongue has the power of life and death. Ooh, that's heavy, isn't it? Ooh, That's heavy. I just want to just not have that on me. But it's real. And if we stop and think for a moment, I think we can all be transported to a moment when somebody said something to us that made us feel alive. Do you remember those moments where somebody looked at you and said, great job. I'm proud of you. I love you. You're beautiful. You're amazing. But we can also be taken back to those times where people said other things to us, can't we? The moment where it devastated us and wrecked our souls. You're a disappointment. You look heavy. (laughs) Let's just be friends. Those things that have been spoken to us that just rip us right through, through and through. You know, studies are coming out and how the power of our words. And we, as I said, we know this, but I watched a video. Go ahead and click that video. You can see part of it as it's playing. Ikea put this out, my favorite furniture company. You may not be able to read it all, but they put two of their own plants in a school under the same conditions, same water, same exposure to light. The only difference is the words that these plants heard. Nobody likes you. No one notices when you're in the room. You're a mistake. You're useless. You're not even green. You look rotten. Are you really even alive? I like you the way you are. Seeing you blossom makes me happy. You're making a difference in the world. You are beautiful. So you heard those words. One was bullied. One was given words of affirmation. They did this for 30 days. 
and then they're going to reveal to us what that happened. They said the only difference was the word spoken to those plants. I put the Ikea logo. If you've been in my office, you know I'm a huge fan. But isn't that fascinating? And that's to a plant. Now, I will say, I was on social media last night or this morning, and I saw an advertisement for a stroller for a plant. Okay, that's a little too far. <laughs> Seriously saw that online. Too far. <laughs> but isn't that fascinating right yeah. there? Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm, I want to know the science behind that, because I'm thinking there was, these were speakers with words. There was no oxygen. I, I don't understand it. But that's not the only place I've seen that study done. And that's not the only place I've seen where it talks about that. And the, if it does that to a plant, yeah. what do you think that does to a child? What do you think that does to a coworker? And you know what? The writer of Proverbs said it, you know, thousands of years ago, life and death. The Apostle Paul, writing to the early Christians, says this. He says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up to their needs, according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The word unwholesome here is used of spoiled fish or rotten fruit. Don't let that be what comes out of your mouth. The world has enough negativity and criticism. We need to be building people up. Now, that is not just positive thinking positive affirmation, you're good enough, you're strong enough, and doggone it, people like you, you know. No, building up sometimes can be challenging, speaking truth to people's lives. But as the Apostle Paul said a few verses before that one, speaking the truth in love so that people can be built up. And I said it earlier, what I think we have to realize is we need discernment and humility when it comes to this. These are going to be words, I think, through this series you hear a lot because they're so desperately needed. Discernment with humility. And think about how that can immediately change how you speak tomorrow. Let's stop and think about the effects of our words. Are we building barriers or are we building bridges? That's really what we need to be thinking about. Are we deepening the dividing lines, creating and highlighting common enemies so we can tear somebody down that we disagree with? Are we defensive, gossiping, spreading every conspiracy theory and slandering others? Or are we building br- bridges to others, the marginalized, the outcast, speaking words of life like thank you or I appreciate you? <laughs> or even challenging words like please be careful, you're heading in a dangerous direction. I'm telling you this because I love you. I saw this played out Friday night. We had Zoo to You. Biggest crowd we've ever had. That event frustrates me so bad because I can never tell what's going to happen. Food truck like stopped orders at one point because they're like, we don't even know if we've got enough food. In an hour, Ashworth Snow had double the business that they've ever had. And people were waiting for an hour to get shaved ice. We had three teenage girls working in the shack. And I just got to tell you, they were working hard. And I went in there, and I mean, they are just busting it. And I, I, I repeatedly, I just said, guys, you are doing an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Keep up the great work. I know this is hard. I know it's frustrating, but you're doing great. I said it probably 10 times to them. And when they left, I said, I hope you guys know how much I appreciate you. You guys are doing, you did an amazing, it'll never be this bad again, I promise. (laughs) But it is awful, it's terrible. And then I'd go work the crowd. And man, there were some people, they were were getting a little restless. And I just went out and I just start talking to people. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please, thank you for waiting. Thank you for your patience because there's anything we can do. They're working as hard as they can. And as soon as you walk out with a word of apology, as soon as you start trying to just explain to people, you could see their faces change. No, 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 it's okay. Thank you. You know, there was, you know, it's the power of our words. Think for a moment. What would it look like if you just decided today, I'm going to speak words of blessing tomorrow. I'm going to bless three people tomorrow just with the things I say. That coworker, I'm going to let that coworker know you're doing a great job. Thank you for your help. I'm going to tell my spouse, my kids, my neighbors, whatever. And can I just add a quick side note? This also applies to you. It's not just what you say to others. (laughs) 
you know where this point came from? Me sitting down yesterday morning in my, just in the quiet of the morning and I'm feeling anxiety. I'm feeling all the emotions from Friday night, the disappointment of not being able to keep up in Ashworth snow and whatever else. And I feel that I'm just, I'm feeling this pressure and I'm, I, I feel me saying these words to myself, you should do better. You should have done this. You should have worked. And I thought, that's crap too. What words are we speaking to ourselves? Because sometimes we need to lean into who we are and who God says. It is a word right there. Who God says you are. God didn't care that it took an hour for us to get Ashworth Snow out the window Friday night. God loved the relationships that were being built. You know, Speech is such a wonderful gift. The words we have, think about that. But it sets us apart from all the other animals of creation, and it reflects our likeness to God. I said last week, remember, after God created humans, he initiated this conversation with us, which is so beautiful and gorgeous. And what can we do to lean into that, to be the bridge builders, to be the words of blessings to others? That's the question. I'm just going to end with that. We talked earlier about sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I saw a a Christian variation of that. It said sticks and stones can only break our bones, but words can be soul destroying. Now, yeah, that's true, but man, I don't want to leave it on a negative. Sticks and stones can break our bones, and may our words be life to others. Let's pray.